Going ice fishing, starting off on the snowmobiles. No, we're not fishing at night. We're starting out before daybreak. Manuskong Bay across the straits. It's about six feet of water. Great fishing up there. Many times it's great fishing. You catch walleye, pike, musky, perch. What do we catch? I'll show you in a second. You're going to come ice fishing with me. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. A handful of typical winter walleye lures from Manuskong Bay. There's a spoon with a single hook, long shanked, a spot of sparkle tape on the back. There's a silver spoon with a fixed hook, jack type spoon. Very effective lure. But here's the classic, a Swedish pimple. Made in Gladstone, it has a heavy body with a small treble hook and it flutters in the water when you jig it. Now, live minnows are a favorite bait. Some people just use the heads. I like to use the whole minnow. This right here is a cold, sometimes difficult process, especially when the wind is howling and the thermometer is dipped. Your fingers aren't as nimble. As, so when you're done, you want to dry your hands off and get them back in your mittens. Here we go. Hook it through the top of the back so it can swim and wiggle to attract a walleye. There's the classic setup. We use a skimmer to clear the ice and the slush out of the hole because the line we're using is very light, two and four pound test. You want the hole clear so you can feed that minnow and the line easily down to the depth that you want to fish. And for walleye, that's just off the bottom a few inches. I'm using a slab jack jigging stick. Local fellow makes these, small number of them every year for Harry. That's all you need for ice fishing walleye. Now we're sitting out on the ice. It's a nice day, temperature is just about freezing, light breeze, it's comfortable, we don't need to be in a shanty. Manuskong Bay, by the way, is a shallow bay, five to six feet deep on the average, very much like Houghton Lake. It's full of fish, an extremely productive fishing ground winter and summer. Now, a nice thing about fishing out in the open is you can move around easily. You can either drill holes next to your snowmobile or sit on a bucket. Now, if the wind's not blowing, this is a comfortable and enjoyable way to be out in the open air. The jigging technique is simple. Just give the rod a twitch every now and then, let it sit. Oftentimes, the walleye will pick up the bait while it's motionless. Sometimes you can't even feel the walleye because they don't move much in the winter after they grab something to eat. Now, there's a gas heater. <laughs> That's the beauty of a shanty. Here we have Bob Garner with his tip-up set right inside the shanty. We only caught one walleye on this trip and the camera wasn't around at the time. So, to bring you a feel for jigging for winter walleye, I did something I've never done in the past six years on Michigan Outdoors. We rehooked a dead fish, fed it down through the hole, and I'm gonna bring you a reenactment of what it's like to hook and land a walleye in the winter in six feet of water. Now, the angler is young Tom Opry, son of the Free Press Outdoor Editor. And young Tom helped us on this day. He caught the only walleye, so had him do the reenactment. Now, it only takes a second or two from the time you feel the fish until you pull it through the hole. That's it. That's all there is to it. There's no playing the fish, but boy, are they good to eat. That's what makes walleye so popular. You ever have fishing up here, Harry, that's guaranteed? Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's the hard thing to do. You know, you're, uh, you're up here uh, shooting for a, a day, uh, and it's, it's, that's really rough uh, to come up and... and have you ever gone to a fishing hole for one day and you traveled uh, two, three hundred miles and you hit it? Usually. Uh, occasionally. Occasionally. <laughs> uh, I, I'd say, uh, you know, up here, if you're here for uh, a week, you may find uh, uh, two or three real good days out of the week that you'll catch fish. Uh, there's times uh, uh, that you can come up maybe the whole week you'll catch fish. Then there's other times, maybe only one day, you'll really get into them, and that day will make up for the rest of the week. But to, to come up uh, on, a, on a spot like now, uh, uh, apparently uh, the, the feeding habits are, are a little slow right now, and we're just not catching fish like we should. Harry Reinfelder always gives us a straight scoop. We know Manuskong Bay has the fish, one of these days we'll hit it. That's what keeps us ice fishing in Michigan outdoors.
One of these days, I'm going to break in this jig and stick on a Manuskong Bay walleye. You can still get out this weekend. It should be a good one for ice fishing and catch a big one for our trophy book. No wonder Russ Anderson looks like he's straining a little bit. That lake trout weighs 20 pounds even, 38 inches long. Russ is from Ironwood. He was trolling a rapala in Lake Superior off Gogebic County last April when this one hit. The UP has big lake trout, but it also produced its share of big bucks this past season. Iron County's a favorite of Steve Camburn from Clinton. That's a 10 point with a 19 and a half inch spread. Bob Davis from Lansing was hunting around home, Eaton County, on the second day of the season. He took this tall racked 10-pointer with a 20-inch spread. Marlon Brady from Saginaw was hunting the Saginaw area. The buck he got the third day of the season had a broken tine, but it made 10 points for the book. And back to fishing, the winter holds a lot of trophies, like this 9-pound, 28-inch walleye. Sam Polizzi from Warren caught it on a jigging rapala from the St. Clair River. He was casting on the 1st of March, not ice fishing. Another unusual trophy catch from that same part of the state, Frank Ruskevich from Marine City was fishing St. Clair County's Bell River in March, caught a red horse sucker that goes over eight pounds. That makes the book. So does this one. It may look small, but not to Menominee anglers. It's slightly over a pound, tasty, and was caught by Terry Massey from Drayton Plains fishing the Osable River last April. Now, while we're showing unusual trophies, here's a Great Lakes fish that a lot of people think is ugly, a burbot or lawyer fish. It hit a smelt in Lake Huron off Iosco County last April for Tim Sawyers from Wurtsmouth Air Force Base. 37 inches, nearly 13 pounds, it's a trophy bourbon. A step up in the looks department is a catfish, this channel cat, speared by Cliff Boyd of Traverse City while he was waiting for muskie in Elk Lake. Big fish. But even bigger is this 23 and a half pound, 44 inch northern pike taken on a tip up, totally unassisted by Nanette Goodrow from Alger. That northern pike earns Nanette the title of our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Angler of the Week. Those are mousies, a fly larva, and a popular bait of ice fishermen are tough to get this year, according to bait wholesaler Jim Knutson. The refuse pits that produce mousies were flooded out by last fall's rain. Next Tuesday night, the East Lansing City Council will again consider an ordinance to restrict ownership of handguns. Even though 35 residents testified at the public hearing against it, the council still seems in favor of passing it. Project Moose 2 begins in Algonquin Provincial Park next Tuesday. Biologists hope to capture 30 moose for a transplant to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And if you've recently received a letter in the mail advising that you've been picked as part of a survey to receive a free boat and outboard motor, do yourself a favor and throw it away. These boats wind up costing between one and 200 bucks. They're made of vinyl and have been called a fraud by Attorney General Frank Kelly. Tragic outdoor headlines. Maybe you saw them in the papers in the past week. Three snowmobile fatalities at Houghton Lake during tip-up town. Three head-on collisions among snowmobilers. What to do about this problem? Everybody's been scratching their head on this. Bob Garner has some thoughts. Ever since snowmobiles became cheap enough that working families could afford them, the North Country has not been the same. There is an anything goes attitude with some snowmobilers on the weekends, and Michigan's North Country is judged to be wide open and free. Snowmobiles and ATVs are treated like toys instead of the dangerous weapons they are when not treated with respect. Laws can't make people do that because they are difficult to enforce. Even though snowmobilers cannot legally drink and drive or drive in a reckless manner, police are almost powerless to make arrests. Police tell me that chasing snowmobilers with a patrol car is tougher than Boss Hog trying to catch the Duke boys. Once the snowmobilers are off the road, not much can be done. Restricting snowmobilers to groom trails with speed limits has been suggested, but why should good snowmobilers be restricted because of a few bad ones? Should the state pass a law setting a maximum speed on snowmobiles sold in Michigan? I don't think so, for two reasons. It would be arbitrary, number one, and with a little ingenuity, the systems could be beat. Snowmobiles have their place in Michigan outdoors. They are a valuable asset to everyone from ice fishermen to resort owners who, without them, would have a tough time making a go of it. Tip Up Town saw 
an extra 50,000 visitors last weekend. And yes, there were three snowmobile deaths. Some would suggest quick fixes to solve what they see as a snowmobile problem. They probably won't work. In fact, the only solution I know is one of the simplest and yet the toughest to do. All snowmobilers must begin to treat their machines like hunters treat a gun, with lots of respect. Follow the Ten Commandments of gun safety and accidents are extremely rare. Follow the rules of the road for snowmobiles and in my opinion, deaths and injuries could be a thing of the past. If you're like me, you probably wish Bob Garner did the outdoor reminder about the turkey permit application February 1st. We got to get ours in, Bob. Yeah, by Sunday, they got to be postmarked. Getting too late. Hey, our new digest is out. That's big news, big headlines. How also, about a letter a from letter, the mailbag? Yeah, letter, a good letter from Ron X of Gatesville. He says, I uh, thought you might like to see a picture of this bull moose we had on our lawn September 6th at 8.30 a.m. We live on the St. Mary's River at Raber Bay. You know, people down in southeastern Michigan think they have problems with the geese on their lawns. <laughs> Nothing like these moose. But this moose probably swam across from the Canadian side, swam across the St. Mary's River, also the moose lift that they're going to be doing uh, in fact right now right now they're getting the starting to get the moose from canada to transplant here and maybe that'll be a more common site in the future this digest we're going to tell you a little bit more when we come up with the address of the show but this is all kinds of features best issue ever i happen to think so make sure you get a hold of a copy if you're not a member of the outdoors club and receive it automatically now a fishing question in the outdoor quiz what is a trot line and who uses it a trot line is a heavy line stretched across the stream or buoyed in open water from which stagings or dropper lines with hooks are attached about every three feet. The baited hooks are left overnight, a technique most commonly used by commercial fishermen for various species of catfish in the south. A really enjoyable thing about Outdoors Forever is we're breaking a lot of new ground. For example, Catherine Mulhaupt came up a couple months ago with a survey, first of its kind That's in the right. country. That's right, no one's ever attempted to ask handicappers about their needs and interest in the outdoors. We did a survey and we got the response back. Let's uh, take a look at the results of the survey. The first question we posed uh, was asking people to describe their handicap. What were they? In well, order of... Uh, basically, in terms of the, the problems or the limitations that their handicaps imposed, the largest one was walking or mobility. Um, and that was obviously the most important. The next was use of arms. Then uh, weak heart, uh, having to use a wheelchair which connects with walking or mobility. Mm -hmm. Poor circulation and impaired vision. Hmm. So those were the basic handicaps that people seem most concerned about. The number one cause of physical disability, surprisingly, people put down arthritis. Right, that was the number one listed handicap, followed by uh, being a paraplegic or a quadriplegic. But you know, a lot of people, even though they have arthritis, they don't consider it a full-fledged handicap. Right, we had people who answered the survey and listed limitations, but didn't list themselves as a handicap, or even though they had severe arthritis. And the limitations we, we asked about, we asked what outdoor activities is your handicap made it difficult to do? Well, consistently it was getting into the woods, but more interestingly, it wasn't just getting there, it was getting there and being able to enjoy getting around in the woods. Then came bow hunting, um, restricted use of upper body mm -hmm. movement makes it hard to bow hunt. Camping, keeping warm, stream fishing, being able to get out into a stream, and uh, getting in and out of a boat. Well, most of those, again, have to do with mobility. And then the obstacles they put down. We asked what obstacles make it difficult, and of course Roger has a problem on rough and uneven terrain with his artificial leg. In different types of weather or different types of terrains, it's very difficult. Long distances, getting to and from piers and parking areas, um, and then barriers such as obstacles across roadways to people who have permits to use ORVs and things like that. Well, there's something like right here where uh, I was fishing, uh, up in northern Michigan, right? You can see it's down in a culvert. Right. And that is a, that's an obstacle, a barrier to get down there. Right. If you have any kind of mobility limitation, something like that is, is no longer possible. So the greatest problem we found was mobility, and solving that problem would bring the greatest satisfaction. You know, it's an interesting thing, what you came up with, Catherine, that uh, you found that able-bodied people travel an average of 184 miles per trip going hunting or fishing. Handicappers travel almost as much. 
but 35% of the non-handicappers use motels and campgrounds, while 44% of handicappers use overnight accommodations. They are actually a big market. Right. They spend money when they go on a hunting trip. If they could solve the mobility problem. Yep. They'd go much more often. We asked the question, what do you think you will never do again that you'd like to do? Uh, the first answer was bow hunt, and that's a very difficult one to, to respond to. Second one was getting into the woods, and again, it wasn't just getting there. It was being able to walk mm -hmm. or ramble or stroll through the woods the way they used to. Then was fishing in a trout stream and hunting rabbits and grouse, which would be difficult, mm -hmm. as you can see. And the first thing that uh, the handicappers would like to see change, they wanted crossbows legalized for handicappers, uh, access improved to fishing sites and boat ramps, liberalizing ATV use right. in areas so they could become a little more mobile, and liberalized rules on bow holding devices once again. Bow hunting, amazingly enough, was uh, really the number one hunting activity that they were interested in. Well, it was least, at least the one that uh, they had the most problems mm -hmm. in continuing. Uh, the others, they were just as interested, but they may be able to get around uh, using different techniques or, or help from friends. The first survey of its kind, Catherine Mulhaupt came up with here in Outdoors Forever. Our new digest has the Outdoors Forever supplement inside, uh, lots of new articles, and a rundown on what we just covered on the survey. So make sure you get a hold of this, uh, write to us if you don't receive the digest. We are going to be, when I say we, Roger, Catherine, and I, at the Central Michigan Sports Show with Outdoors Forever programs every day. That's one of the events on our outdoor calendar. On the heels of a very crowded tip-up town, the Oldsmobile Outdoors Club has their family days on the ice at Houghton Lake and the public's invited. You can see the largest mounted trophies of 1986 and hear some great stories, like the one about the 29-pound carp. And I was ice fishing for bluegill with two-pound test line. Two? There it is. This line right here? That's the line I caught it on. And there's the ice fishing. And this is, this is the teardrop lure. Yes. Waxworm and Waxworm and uh, Dot Rocker. How'd you do it? How'd you even get him up to the hole? Cut a bigger hole. <laughs> uh, it took an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, wow. I fought him uh, for an hour and 45 minutes and uh, was getting ready to leave. And I hit this fish. Have you, I, had, have you? I had 24 bluegill. I was trying for one more. For your last All 10 finalists and their spouses will receive a weekend of gourmet fish and wild game meals in the rustic dining room of Lost Arrow Resort near Gladwin. With personalized behind the scenes cooking lessons by gourmet chef Pat McGuire. Pat will also be one of our judges in the cook off on March 12th. Accommodations at Lost Arrow for this weekend will include your choice of a cabin or a motel room, with the two top winning couples receiving the two deluxe rooms, complete with hot tub, king-sized waterbed, and stereo system. Transportation around Lost Arrow will be by horse and buggy. Avery Sterling's prize-winning team of uh, Percherons will be used to tour the woods at Lost Arrow. This recipe is a fabulous recipe called Elegant Filet Au Gratin A that Ray Cook from Holland sent to us. Ray. We're only bucking one problem here in our gourmet food taster. <laughs> and that is a couple of your ingredients. Well, we don't know how he's going to take it this year. Bob, you oh, want to taste in? it first? No, no why don't you taste it first? Surprise, surprise. This is, we could call this elegant filet Bob Garner surprise. <laughs> and, uh, but this is an outstanding recipe. I'm going to dish it up here. And Kath, why don't you tell us the ingredients that we're talking about. Okay, the name's a little bit longer than the dish, actually. It takes longer to prepare. Now, we're putting some walleye in the front there and catfish in the back. That's right. And I don't think you're going to be able to tell the difference once it's cooked at all. It's got some very colorful ingredients. It's got tomatoes and parsley some, and some butter, some half and half. Some, some Swiss some, cheese. Some vermouth. Some Bob's eyes are watering, I think. <laughs> some paprika. Anyway, we'll salt and pepper. <laughs> Okay, you're going to actually salt or paprika your fillets, and you want quite a bit because it loses it. They're going to be poached in That's right. vermouth, and, which and isn't, isn't white wine, Bob. No, red wine, <laughs> it's, but it's red wine that's bad? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, and this calls for a whole cup here, and you're going to put it in the oven and just poach it. And Poaching means it sort of boils. In the liquid. In that's the liquid. Right. And this doesn't take very long. 
and you want to flake. You can tell oh, when it's done by how flake it is, that. and it flakes very easily here. And that vermouth is a to me, when it's cooked that way, isn't real strong. No, it, it loses some when of it. When it flakes, you take the, the juice out That's of right. the... Pour it back into a saucepan. You're going to put some flour in here. Three, three tablespoons right, of flour. Because you're going to make a sauce. Okay, and this is how you make an easy sauce in that... That's right. Now you want to mix remote. your butter with your flour to make a paste. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to just kind of drop the whole glob into the <coughs> poaching liquid. You okay, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to add another quarter cup of vermouth because this will thicken up and you want to stir it constantly because it's going to burn very quickly. Think of it, Bob, like like cheese, uh, like a cheese sauce. It would be macaroni and cheese. <laughs> then you're going to add your half and half to make it creamy. You With pour tomatoes this. on top of yep. the fish. Yep, you can pour this all over the top. And then the crowning <laughs> blow to Bob <laughs> Garner, the Swiss cheese. Yep, and this is great Swiss cheese. You're just going to sprinkle it all over the top. We've got to take a look at Bob's face. <laughs> And parsley. Okay. And you want to use fresh parsley, definitely, for this recipe. Bob, this is the recipe. Take a look at this man <laughs> after not he's... You're asking for more. No, in fact, I'm going to give you back what I've got. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a com I'm sure this is a delicious recipe. The combination of ingredients, for some reason, it, it, it just doesn't hit me right. It's probably those just that one a year that shows up that I just... I can't... I can't... <laughs> To anyway, make a long try it. I'm sure everybody else will love it. Answer to a lot of questions yeah, we get. To, to make a long story short, Swiss cheese and wine and Bob Garner do not mix in a recipe. No, and they didn't this time either. So. Well, what would you think of it, though? It's, uh, it's nice to stay within easy walking distance of it. <laughs> well, Ray Cook from Holland, Kath and I think it's a great recipe. Absolutely. I think a lot of you viewers will love it. Mm -hmm. Take their advice, not mine. <laughs> Take their advice. It's an outstanding recipe, a way to cook those fish that you're going to maybe catch this weekend outdoors. Try to get outdoors if you can. It's a great place to be. We'll see you next week. Okay, I don't need to beat it into the ground. It's not my favorite, but everyone else loves it. Elegant filet au gratiné is in this issue of the Outdoor Digest, along with all of our TV recipes for January and February plus articles on deer by Leonard Lee Rue, shooting, fishing, and a lot more. The Outdoors Forever section has articles on pier fishing, laws, viewer mail, and a lot more. Packed with 56 pages of hunting and fishing information, you should have a copy. Caught the guy in the shanty, and, uh, and I'm sure he uh, was very pleasant asking <laughs> the guy to leave the shanty. But other than that, no, it's, uh, hey, it's sportsmen out here, you know, and uh, uh, there's a lot of good people that come up ice fishing. We don't uh, we don't seem to run into that type of problem. You can't be too thin-skinned and be a nice fisherman. Uh, actually, the more layers you have, the better it is. And uh, <laughs> as as you well know, Fred, uh, a good crop of hair would help too. <laughs> yes, it would. Yes, it would. Yes. <laughs> well spoken, Harry Reinfelder. <laughs> I was running out of things to say, Fred. <laughs> <Is so. that laughs> <right>? <laughs> oh, that's good. That doesn't happen too often. But that's good. <laughs>